So it's already time. Let's uh, let's get started. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the lightning session of this uh, mini symposium. Uh, my name is Quinn Chen, a uh, professor in statistics at UConn. Uh, I'm serving as the program chair of the ASA uh, Stack Computer Session, and I'm also a committee member of this mini symposium, working together with David, Jing, and Ming. So now it's really my pleasure to chair this uh, lightning session. This is the first time we uh, we have this kind of session. I think it's uh, safe to say that this will be the most vibrant and fast-paced uh, segment of our program. So. Uh, this year, we received close to 20 abstracts. Um, so this is really a testament to the high interest and innovation in our field of stack computing. After this, we only uh, we are only able to uh, invite nine um, selective uh, presentations. Um, so it is really highly selective and the competitive process. Uh, so I think now we should all be very excited to witness uh, some of the most compelling work in this field. So. Uh, before we start, again, I want to remind all the speakers that each presentation is only budgeted with seven minutes from start to finish. Uh, I'm glad that we have resolved uh, all the technical issues. Uh, I know that you have all worked hard to, hard to uh, distill your research into this very limited time frame, so I really appreciate that. Um, and as I introduce each speaker, uh, I kindly ask you to begin sharing your screen, uh, opening your webcam and mic. And just get ready to uh, uh, to your talk. Talk. Uh, so let's try to have this session to be uh, seamless as soon uh, as seamless as possible. So uh, to our audience, um, we will hold a Q and A session at the end of the presentations to address all your questions. So please submit your questions in chat or Q and A uh, during the presentations. All right. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, let's get started. Uh, our first speaker today is Professor. Guo Wei Xi. Uh, she is currently an associate professor in statistics at Purdue University. Uh, she's going to talk about vulnerabilities of deep learning and robust deep ensemble. Uh -huh. Guo Wei, please share uh, your screen. Thank you for having me here. Uh, I'll share the screen. So, is it Shari? No, it's not. Uh, so is it here? No. Sorry, still not here. So there's a sharing button. Okay, right now we can now we can see your uh, slides. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, well, as the vulnerability of deep learning networks, it actually started quite early. Uh, so right after deep neural network become very popular and win um, a big competition in 2014, then people immediately uh, discover, well, if given a correctly labeled clean sample, adding minor um, invisible perturbations can make a neural network misclassify the um, image and they call this a docero example. So on the bottom of this slide, well, the left one, is the correctly classified airplane. And the middle one and the right one are the misclassified ones. They're misclassified as deer. The, uh, the middle one is generated by our approach, and the one on the right is generated by an attack algorithm. So after many years of research on neural network, it becomes a very powerful tool. But there are still many unanswered questions. And the first question, which is also very important to the existence of these adversarial examples, is what's the shape of a deep neural network classification boundary? And if we read all the published papers, and all these papers would describe the boundary using this graph. Sorry, my kid just tried to get into the room. Yeah, so it's... <laughs> It's a surface. It's a surface that's trying to separate uh, two classes. This is very similar to what we perceive as a kernel classifier. But later we'll see, well, neural network's classification boundary is very different than all the existing classical classifiers. And another question, consequently, is where, where are the regions containing these adversarial examples? Currently, there are many attack algorithms. 
The type algorithm just use an optimization approach. So given a clean sample, they try to find the grading, then discover where to add well, those invisible perturbations. And a type algorithm, some can generate just one or two of those are examples, given one clean sample. And some other algorithms can uh, generate around 100 or 200 of those are examples. But what are the regions? And popular belief is you have to go through the optimization approach, find the grading, and sampling will not give a dose of examples. And our findings is, well, very different. We will find sampling will work, and sampling will give us a vast amount of a dose of examples, giving just one clean sample. Well, we can imagine clean sample is a point in the center, in the high dimensional future space. And just imagine you draw a delta uh, neighborhood in the high dimensional space. Just in this delta ball, there will be many adosal regions. And then the last question, well, past you know, decades of research prove uh, some theoretical property, uh, the generalization error bound for neural network. Generally, people would say it's proportional to a uh, simple size to the power of negative one half times a constant. And the constant is determined by the depth and the width of a neural network. But well, now neural network, we focus on convolutional neural network here. Well, they are trained with well, millions or even more well, training uh, samples. And we still find all those are examples. So there's a discrepancy between the theoretical results and what we actually observe happening you know, for a docile example. Hopefully, well, we at least give some ideas, insights about why this happens. So let's skip to here. Well, so now uh, a neural network training is a non-convex optimization process, meaning if we use the same training data set, fix the model structure, fix the training parameters, and just change the initial random seeds, then we'll end up with different uh, trained models, different model parameters. So when we try to see what's the classification boundary surrounding one clean uh, sample, just a point in the future space in its delta neighborhood, we actually need to train multiple neural network models. So here we use the CIFAR-10 data set. The CIFAR-10 data set has 10 classes. It's a low resolution color image. That airplane comes from CIFAR-10 data set. And here we retrain mobile night. It's a well uh, network structure proposed by uh, Google, but we re-optimize mobile night parameters to get the best performance on CIFAR-10 data. We trained five times using five initial seeds, and these five trained models all achieve very similar um, optimal performance around 7.3 percent misclassification rate. And next, well, we choose model one, the first one, and use a attack algorithm, which is called BIML2 attack, to attack model one. This attack is able to generate, well, at least around 100 adversarial examples, given one clean sample. Then, well, then uh, based on all the adversarial examples, these all look like airplanes. Well, we just look at, well, which dimensions have the largest perturbations. Uh, the widest interval for perturbations. Uh, well, as a color image, we consider all three color channels. Then, meaning if we vectorize a color image, a tensor structure, then we end up with 3,072 uh, dimensions. The attack actually adds perturbations to almost all of these dimensions. But the largest dimension will see a wide interval meaning uh, the range of the adversarial values are uh, rather big. Then we go from the biggest interval to the smallest interval. And after 2,000 dimensions, yeah, after 2,000 dimensions, it's nearly a uh, constant. So we see for model one, after just 200 uh, dimensions, well, the misclassification rate by sampling would reach 100%. But model five is another model, just consistent have 0% misclassification rate. And other models in the middle will see misclassification rate increase than drop. So from this discovery, we actually uh, say there are three types of adosal examples. The popular belief is type two. 
all the trained models using the same training data set, even with different structure, will all misclassify this adult cell example as the transferable region type 2. But we also discovered type 1 and type 3. That's not in the literature. Type 1 says, well, the model under attack will misclassify it. But there are other models that could correctly classify them. Type 3 means the model under attack could put the right label, but there exists some other model that puts a wrong label. So type 1 and type 2, we call them uncertainty regions for neural network. Oh, and based on our discovery, we can well, have a conceptual plot for the neural network classification boundary. So surrounding a clean sample, a point in the hyper, uh, in the high dimensional space, just a delta uh, neighborhood well, with a very small radius. Well, the classification boundary are very cracked. And inside cracks, these are those are regions. Uh, is the time up? Yes, your time is up. Yeah, then I don't have time to talk about robust ensemble. So these are just... We will, yeah, there will be, I guess, some questions about how to use your methods to make uh, models more robust. I think assemble is definitely a great idea. So uh, because of time, I think I will have to uh, let you stop. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. yeah thank you. All right, so our next speaker is uh, Howard Reck from uh, Fred Hutchinson Data Science Lab. Uh, Howard is a software development engineer. Um, sorry, that's my timer. So uh, Howard is a software development engineer um, at the Frank Hutchison Data Science Lab. Uh, he is interested in using R and other program languages to build useful tools. So let's uh, hear from Howard. <clears throat> Today I'll be uh, talking about Loki, which is a shiny app for creating automated videos. If you want to follow along my slides, um, I put my slides in the chat. Also, they are at bit.ly uh, slash ASA dash Loki. So before I give a live demo of Loki, mm. I wanted to talk about or give a brief overview. So Loki takes as input a public Google slide URL or a Microsoft PowerPoint file. Then it, it extracts the speaker notes from the slides and converts it to an audio file using an open source text -to speech engine. And then it downloads the slides as images and it ultimately generates a video MP4 file where each image is presented along with the corresponding audio. So this lets you easily update your videos without having to re-record your voice every time you make updates to your slides. Uh, so this will be useful for uh, submitting uh, video abstracts to conferences and journals. So now I'm going to do a live demo of Loki. Uh, Loki can be found at loki.fairhutch.org. And here's the URL that I will use as a input to Loki. So this is what Loki looks like. Um, you first start off by providing an email address where the video should be sent. So let's put in my email address. Um, you choose a presentation tool. So for now, we'll do Google Slides. And then you put in the Google Slides URL. And you choose a text to speech service, which for now is Coakley DTS. And you select your model. Uh, <clears throat> and we'll choose Jenny. So once you click generate, the uh, deep learning model will run in the back end. And while it's running, I want to kind of uh, talk about what's on the screen here. So after a model is run, the video and before file will show up here. And then below the video, you'll see the title of your presentation slides. And then you'll see these three buttons. Uh, this button lets you download your video as a MP4 file. This lets you download subtitles corresponding to your video as a subtitle file called SRT. And then this button lets you send your video to the email address that you provided as an MP4 file. Hello, participants. Let me play this video for a sec. Participants of the November 4th, 2023 Statistical Computing in Action. My name is Jenny, and I would like to thank the organizing committee for giving Harrod the chance to present his shiny app. 
I will stop talking now to respect the time limit. I hope you enjoy Harrod's talk. So, let's see how Loki works under the hood. So, Loki is an interactive web application. It is a slick car that the user sees and interacts with. While it looks fancy and polished, there are many components that make this car move. Koki TTS is a free open source text speech engine, and it starts the audio component generation. It creates the binary wave audio file that will be used as uh, the audio for Loki. So Koki TTS is an open source library for advanced text-to-speech generation developed by Koki, an AI startup. And it's very easy to install from PyPy. I just type in pip install TTS on the command line. And text-to-speech R package acts as the gearbox of our car, the Loki. Just as drivers can select different gears, users can select different options, such as voices, languages, um, and the text-to-speech R package acts as a wrapper for Kukui TTS to tell it how to make the audio file. So RER package is the drivetrain of our car. That's what connects the engine to our wheels. The ARI, it takes the WAV file from text-to-speech and uses it as the audio component of the video. Also, it combines the audio with the images of the slides to generate a video. And it's just like how a drivetrain coordinates various parts of a car to make it move. So in summary, Koki TTS is the open source text-to-speech engine. Text-to-speech is an R package wrapper for Koku TTS, start the audio component generation. RE is an R package that combines audio and images to create the video and B4 file. And Loki is our R shiny app. So there are a few nuances to Loki. If you want to add positives to the speech, you can do so with commas, but not too many. So in our Jenny model, you can add positives to these um, between these two sentences uh, by putting in about 10 to 15 commas in between these sentences. One minute, please. All right, thanks. Um, also, if you have acronyms, if you have acronyms, in your uh, speaker notes, uh, you can spell them out. So ASA should not be just typed as ASA, it should be typed as ASA. So in the future, I hope to implement voice cloning with the XTTS model, which is a voice generation model that lets you clone your voice into different languages. How this works is you provide a 30 second audio of your voice and then you can get the deep learning model to clone your voice. And then you provide a text, such as, I welcome to enter the R, and the model generates the audio in your voice. So thank you. And if you have any questions, please send me an email. Thank you, Howard. Right on time. So our thank next you. speaker is Chris. Sankaran from uh, University of Wisconsin Madison. Chris is an assistant professor at uh, the University of Wisconsin Madison. His group studies interactive statistical computing and its application to genomics. So now let's welcome Chris to talk about Beyond Black Box Simulation. Hey, hello everyone, and and thank you to all the organizers for putting together such an interesting session. I've been learning a lot. And it's been exciting. So I'm going to be sharing with you some work on. Uh, Thinking about the relationship between simulation and statistics, it's all work that's discussed in this paper. So here's a link, all the code examples, you can follow along at this link, the slides. And it's written jointly with my former advisor, Susan Holmes. So our starting point is that 
you can, I think of simulation as becoming something like a universal language in a lot of science. So uh, some example applications in climate modeling, it's very common to use these large scale simulations to understand under different kind of climate mitigation strategies, what might the long run climate be like? So you can do all these kind of hypothetical scenarios, simulate future climate. I think those are the climate simulators are pretty well known. Maybe an area that you might not be familiar with where simulators are also used a lot is in single cell genomics. So why is it useful in genomics? There's a lot of situations where you want to develop some method, but the, the ground truth is hard to know, right? So if you're doing cell type annotation, if you're doing batch effect correction, kind of common problems in genomics, getting the ground truth is very hard. So instead what people have to come up with are very faithful simulators which do give you that ground truth. And this is used a lot in benchmarking. Okay. The question we're starting with is, we know there are all these simulators being used across a variety of scientific domains. What is the connection with statistics? Okay, and to explain the title a little bit, what do I mean by beyond black box simulators? So I actually mean something a little bit more subtle than just black or, or transparent or black or white box simulation. I actually have a different kind of metaphor in mind where it's more like you have lots of building blocks. You have lots of simple modules that you can combine together to build a more complicated, more subtle generative model, right? So the, the point of view is like, you start with all these little stochastic modules. So here's a kind of small examples, like you can have a regression model, maybe you have a clustering module, hierarchy module. And starting from these smaller blocks, you can build up a more faithful simulator that's adapted to your analysis. Right? It's that kind of agency where a designer can build a simulator that's exactly suited to their problem and their context. It's that agency that makes things no longer a black box. Once you have that sort of control, a very natural thing to do is to try iterating your simulator. So in, in this example, the top are data that we're trying to emulate. The bottom are three different attempts at generating that data, like building a simulator to generate that data. And the point is, when you start off, you likely don't have a very accurate simulator. But since things are interactive, you can iteratively update it. And one of the nice things is that these days, there are very good, there are very good discrepancy measures. It's actually very similar to the adversarial thinking in the very first, in the very first lightning session talk, where from those discrepancy measures, you can decide some adjustments to make to your simulator so that by the end, these are actually very difficult to distinguish. Okay, so we have these modern kinds of simulators. I want to now give an example or two examples, one where simulation can guide statistics and another where statistics can help with simulation. So for this first one, where simulation can help with statistics, I think one really attractive possibility is we can start thinking, we can start revisiting classical ideas in experimental design in very complicated kinds of data sets when we have simulation at our disposal. So the case study here is we're thinking about the microbiome and study design in the microbiome. And this is an area where we know that there's lots of person-to-person -person variation. So if you want to understand the effect of some treatment on the microbiome, you need to somehow account for the fact that there, there's this variation from person to person, right? The extremes are sort of clear, right? In the extreme where there's lots of person to person variation, the natural thing to do is block. Assign all the treatments for each person. And then you'll still, like each of these lines is one person, you'll still be able to notice the direction of the effects of the treatments, even though there's so much difference across people. And the other extreme is also clear. If there's not much person to person variation, you don't need blocking at all. But what about that middle ground? How do you navigate that middle ground? The idea is you can use a simulation to go through your entire analysis workflow. So if you're able to make a simulator with different amounts of person-to-person -person variation, you can see using whatever processing, whatever statistical workflow you're eventually going to use, you can compare the efficiency of different designs. So here I'm showing the efficiency of an unblocked versus a blocked design. And the main takeaway in this example is that the block design is quite a bit more efficient. Right? Like the posterior effect estimates are much narrower than in the unblocked design. 
the point in, in this example isn't that, oh, you should always block in microbiome studies. The point is that experimental design isn't just heuristics. Like when we're in these complicated data settings, sometimes people just think about blocking or not blocking as like a heuristic choice. The point is that in simulation, it no longer has to be heuristic. That you can actually gather data that's relevant. In my last example, I'm going to talk about Covisim. This is an agent-based model of how disease spreads. It was used to make decisions like, should we like, close, take virtual classes for however long instead of in person? These are very complicated to run because you need to actually estimate, you need to model each person, each agent, and all their interactions with their environment. Right? I mean, very rich. Okay, they're very interesting to use, but kind of difficult to, to run computationally. And where statistics comes in is you can do something called emulation. So the idea of emulation is you map from the, uh, the simulation hyperparameters, you learn a model to the summary statistics that you would eventually be interpreting from the simulation output. Once you've learned that mapping, you can start running something and getting this, the final summaries that you would have been interested in anyways, but you can get it very, very fast without having to run the entire simulation because you've already learned this approximation from the hyperparameter to the summary statistic. In this example, it was, it was 10 times faster. Okay, so I hope these examples are gonna make you interested about the connections between simulation and statistic. Here's the paper link again, and looking forward to the rest of the session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chris. So we will leave the questions um, and answers to the, to the end of the session. So our next speaker is uh, uh, are, are going to be I guess two speakers maybe um, Zoe uh, Ringberg and uh, Emily Robinson. Uh, I don't know whether both of you will present it, just one of you. Um, so um, Emily and Zoe are uh, assistant professors in the statistics department at the California uh, Polytechnic uh, State University. So they will talk about enhancing statistical computing education through game plans. Please. Can you please unmute yourself? Got all the pieces. Yeah, now we can't hear from you. Great. So thank you for the introductions. Uh, today we're going to tell you about how we implemented what we've called game plans into our statistical computing course. So we're gonna provide context of the course, then introduce the why, what, and how of game planning before sharing some examples and what we hope to do in the future. So between the two of us, we have taught four courses in statistical computing with R, which has a focus on the tidyverse. Uh, most of the students in this course are undergraduate statistics and computer science majors, with a few of them from adjacent disciplines and a handful of life science master's students. So coming into this course, although we have a prerequisite of a previous programming course, typically taken from computer science, we've noticed that students still struggle through the reasoning on logical programming tasks. All right, so before we talk about what we mean by game planning, we wanna start by highlighting why we feel there is a need for this type of technique. So in teaching students to code, we found that there tends to be a gap between students getting a data task and then knowing the appropriate code to write. So for example, students are likely comfortable with the data set they are starting from, and they likely have a vision of the, what the outcome should look like, something like adding a new column to their data set, taking two data sets and combining them together, or creating some sort of detailed visualization. But many students are lost on how to start writing code to get from one from the data to the other. And so this is what we need to teach, and this is where game planning enters the picture. Additionally, um, even for students who might feel comfortable with some of the basic data tasks, data wrangling and visualizations, the tasks that we ask, ask students to perform get more and more complicated as we move through the quarter and have more and more steps. And so this makes that transition or translation from the data task to the code more tricky, and we found that game planning can be useful even for those students that maybe are coming in with a little bit more coding experience. So in order to get students to communicate their thought process and further identify where they might be getting stuck in the problem, uh, we began giving examples during lecture and asking students to provide a visual representation of the desired coding task as kind of this intermediate step between 
the coding task and the actual code itself as a way to map their coding strategies before implementation. And so here we see two potential variations of game plans. And so while we introduce students to Excaladra, which is an online uh, whiteboard, it's our new favorite tool kind of for everything. Um, instead, a few of them do sometimes choose to use paper and pencil uh, or a tablet to create their game plans. And so during JSM this last summer, I attended a Birds of a Feather in which we discussed teaching statistical computing courses following uh, kind of this computer science literature, which advocates for breaking down the steps of a complex problem solving task and actually writing about code in order to improve student success in the course. All right, so we're going to look at two quick example um, game plans. I do want to note that the ones that you're seeing on our slides have been created by us, um, but they're based on themes that we've seen throughout real student work. So I gave this question on a midterm exam in, the, in my statistical computing class. Students were working on um, working with data on expeditions up Mount Everest, and they were asked to find the 10 expeditions with the largest ratio of hired staff to climbers. And I asked them for specific variables that I wanted them to output for those expeditions. In the first part of this question, they were asked to create a game plan, and in the second part, they were asked to implement that game plan to actually write code. And so here is a bit of our code that I was looking for from these students. This is the type of tidyverse functions I was hoping they would use and sort of the ordering of the steps I was looking for. So this is an example game plan. In this one, the student started from the question prompt. You can see that written at the top of the page and also started from the head of the data set. And in their game plan, they identified which variables um, would be needed to answer different parts of the question prompt as well as which tidyverse functions were going to be needed as well. Um, there, we can see from this, sorry, go back real quick. <laughs> we can see from this um, that there's not a whole lot of emphasis here on ordering the steps, um, but there is a clear connection between what the question is asking and which columns of the data set are relevant and which functions are going to be needed. So we also have a second example here. This student focused a little bit more in their game plan on writing actual lines of code, which I found was fairly common um, later in classes. But again, we do see this clear mapping from the question, the question prompt at the top to the, each variable or line of code that they were going to use. And we can see in this example that the student is showing a clear understanding that the order of the code matters. You can see that they created their ratio variable early on and then used that variable in subsequent lines. So this was just one example of a data task in the interest of time. Um, we can't get into many and to any more, but we have used game plans throughout our st statistical computing course um, for all of these different tasks listed here, as well as many others. We encourage students to make game plans for each new data task that they encounter and even do require some game planning in some of our assignments. So we did get some pushback on asking students to game plan. Um, and we noticed that instead of maybe game planning and then coding, uh, some students would actually code and then write their game plans. However, we do wonder if this ordering might still pose some benefits to students in communicating their uh, coding and thought process. Uh, additionally, we still have some questions about if and how to assess student game plans and what that kind of looks like. So previously, uh, we implemented game plans as kind of an ad hoc way to help students communicate their struggles. Uh, however, looking forward, we're working on implementing this strategy in a more structured way and hopefully soliciting feedback from students about the method and strategy. And so we would love to hear from you about your experiences teaching similar courses and if you implement any sort of strategies uh, of writing about code in those. Great, so here are some of our references from computer science education literature, um, and we have our emails here as well. So please do get in touch if you have any questions or comments. Thanks. Thank you very much, Louie and Emily. This is great. You two make a great team, by the way. Thank you. All right, um, so let's uh, introduce our next speaker. Jonathan City, are you here? Jonathan is from uh, uh, Sage Therapeutics, um, and uh, the talk will be on MMRM, a robust and comprehensive R package for implementing mixed models for repeated measures. Hello, can you hear me? 
Yes. Great. Okay, so uh, hello, I'm Jonathan City. My video uh, is being very uh, working, so you won't see my fancy hoodie uh, while I talk, but you can imagine one. Um, so I'm going to introduce Open Stat Open Statsware and the R package MMRM. Um, I'm doing this on behalf of the ASA Software Engineering Working Group. The Open Statsware is the official working group of the ASA Biopharmaceutical Section. It was formed uh, in August of 2022. It has uh, 40, roughly 40 members and growing of 30 organizations across the industry, pharma. Um, and the homepage is linked below here. The working, group, the working group objectives primarily are to engineer our packages that implement important statistical methods. Secondary, uh, we strive to develop and disseminate best practices for engineering high quality open source statistical software. Our main uh, working packages right now, uh, what I'm going to present right now is the MMRM package, which is a frequentist inference uh, for longitudinal data. Um, it has a sister package, uh, the Bayesian MMRM, which is uh, based on BRMS package in R. And finally, the HTA, the health technology assessment package that is used to support HTA submissions across various countries. The MMRM package. The motivation for this package was um, as a popular choice for analyzing longitudinal continuous outcomes in randomized clinical trials. The MMRM method is a workhorse for a lot of the different uh, designs and implementations of analyzing longitudinal data in pharma. Uh, we did have a problem that there was no great R package to, so to solve the MMRM problem. Uh, it was thought that it was solved through LME4 and LMER test packages, but this approach failed a lot of times on large data sets and was pretty slow. The NLME package does not give the adjusted degree, degrees of freedom for set of weight and does have convergence issues. And the estimates that it does give are approximate uh, through EMM means. Finally, we tried the GLMMTMB package to calculate the set of weight adjusted degrees of freedom but that didn't work either. The main idea was that we were only going to solve a, narrow, a very narrow scope for a fixed effects problem with a structured covariance matrices that we knew up front. This idea is based on using the template model, build, model builder directly. It is the same C, uh, C++ package that is used to drive the GLMM TMB. We do this uh, by implementing, again, C++ uh, libraries. And what we want to have is to provide an R, an R side solution that has fast convergence times and generates estimates closest to SAS as possible. The advantages of using the template model builder C++ framework is that it is uh, defining objective functions has automatic differentiation of log likelihood as a function of the variance parameters. Added benefits are that we get the gradient and the Hessian exactly without additional coding. And this could be used from the R side with a TMB package interface and plugged into different optimizers. Why isn't this just another R package? So ongoing maintenance and support from the pharma industry. So the Big five, there are big five companies, uh, Roche, Merck, BI, Gilead, AstraZeneca, all have stake in this package and uh, have active development going on uh, through to, since 2022. Development using best practices as a showcase for high quality, for a high quality package. We do this through unit and integration tests to ensure accurate results and comparability to SAS. And more importantly, we have in-depth documentation on the, on the package website that I put in the chat before I started. Um, documentations for methods, functionality, 
and a comparison to other packages and languages. So the NLME, the GLMM, the TMB, LME4, and the Proclimix, which is a standard um, way in SAS to solve the MMRM problem. Highlighted features of MMRM. So currently the covariance structures that we have uh, built in are listed uh, on the slide here. Uh, we allow for group specific covariance estimates and weights. Hypothesis testing, we have integration with EMM means for least squares means and least squares means differences. We have uh, built in status weight and Kenward Roderick adjustments that are propagated through the model through EMM means. So the user doesn't have to do anything special in order to, to apply those adjustments. There's a robust uh, sandwich estimator for the covariance. And more importantly, the package is built with a thought of how do we integrate it with the ecosystem that is in R. So tidy models is, has a built-in parsnip engine and recipes for streamlined model fitting, um, similar to what Lucy uh, was showing beforehand. There's also teal turn and R tables integration for post-processing and reporting to make it easy to move from modeling to reporting. Finally, the comparison with other software. Uh, we have run extensive comparisons. I mean it, please. Yep. Uh, NLME, GLM, TMB, and LME4, along with Proclimix. The main highlights, MMRM has a faster convergence time. It is roughly five times faster than GLM, TMB, 10 times faster than SAS, and 50 times faster than the other R packages. MMRM also provides the closest results of Proclimix. Uh, you can see a detailed result of the online comparison on the website. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Jonathan. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Sean Sacco from University of Connecticut. Uh, Sean is uh, currently a postdoc uh, research associate in the Department of Statistics at UConn and a member at the Center for Population Health at UConn Health Center. She's asking to talk about tips and tricks to improve the speed of your prediction pipelines and other analysis. Thank Sean, you, please. Gwen. Yeah, please go ahead. Yes. So we're going to go through a number of methods today to really speed up things across the board. Uh, and this will apply both to R and Python, uh, but I'll mainly focus with R. Nowadays, data sets are large. Analyses are complex, like neural networks and training them takes a long time, you know, days, even weeks sometimes. Uh, but luckily, there's a number of packages out there, a number of methods to speed everything up. For prediction pipelines, there's typically, you know, if you want to put it into five buckets, uh, we do things like data cleaning, processing, generating our cohorts, screening features, training models, testing them and repeating the process. And as I mentioned, kind of across the board, we can really speed things up in a number of ways. But, of course, this will help you do other analyses. In the first step, one kind of key element that occurs a lot of time in the cohort generation or cleaning process is the idea of aggregation. Where if we have multiple units uh, or multiple rows per one unique unit, let's just say multiple records per patient, we want to aggregate it down into uh, one unique row per patient or unit. Using the base function in R, it's quite slow, but we can use a package called data.table that really speeds things up. And there's some example syntax down there, but it's unique to every problem. Here I simulate some data, and we can see that using the base function it takes around 14 seconds, but with data.table, it's less than a second. And this package is also available in Python, just without the period, so data table. We also write and read a lot of data, typically large data sets. And luckily enough, uh, using data.table again, there's a faster way. There's also other packages out there to do this, but using the base function with that same simulated data, it would take around two minutes, but with the data.package uh, or the data.table package, it's again around a second. Another thing that we do is feature or outcome engineering. And here I provide just kind of two examples. Firstly, 
we can create a rank variable and using the base function, it's quite slow. I promise I'm not just strictly promoting data.table here, but they also have a faster ranking procedure. And as another example of variables we can generate is something that would look for the presence of a pattern which in, within a string. Now, uh, using the base function grepl, it's also quite slow, but we can do something like a two-step process where we first look for partial pattern matching, and then within those um, entries that match that criteria, then look for the full pattern. And it's not always useful, but particularly with very diverse um, patterns and strings, it does speed things up. So again, let's look at some simulated data. Comparing the rankings, we use the base function, it's around 10 seconds, but fast rank, it's around two. Unfortunately, in Python, uh, the data.table implementation does not have this yet. But as a suggestion, you can use NumPy versus Pandas, and you can Google the specifics around with this. For pattern searching, if we use kind of, again, just simulated data and look at the traditional function, it would take around 30 seconds, but this partial matching uh, iteration uh, procedure would cut it down to around 15. This next topic really applies to analyses in, in various respects. But particularly in the context when you have data that is sparse, so uh, data sets that contain mostly binary variables like genetics data or patient records. If you use a default format, like a data frame, it stores all the zeros as quote unquote valid data. But in reality, we can use uh, sparse matrix formats, which will treat the zeros essentially as blank uh, and forego storing them, even though that's a gross opler simplification of it. In R, you would use the matrix package, and in Python, you would use scipy.sparse. And just to show some elements of this, firstly, if you look at the storage size um, in your workspace, the traditional um, size would be around 240 megabytes for this simulated data, and around half for data generated with uh, the matrix package. But importantly, it doesn't always, uh, only reduce the size, it increases the speed of operations too. And a number of packages have this um, just built into it, but you can also write your code from scratch to take advantage of this. So for instance, uh, you know, a lot of times when we're doing feature screening, we might use Pearson's R, or we're just interested in descriptives for this. And here uh, we can see if we use a traditional data format to run Pearson's R on a number of variables, take around 14 seconds, but if it's a sparse matrix, it's only around three. And on the topic of feature screening, we can talk about screening features with Fisher's or chi-squared test, which is popular. And in R, but not Python, you can supply the raw data to run these tests. But in reality, it still needs to compute the actual tables, the counts, and instead of just giving it raw data and having it be computed for each screen feature, you can calculate all these values beforehand. And providing a, a, another simulated example, it's not that much quicker, but all the time adds up. So using the raw data, it's around 100 seconds, but the table data reduces it uh, to 70 seconds. One minute, please. Uh, and for our last bit is talking about statistical modeling. So a lot of models require iterative processing to converge, or you might want to hyper uh, tune the hyper parameters, cross validate the same. And when available, you should definitely um, try to use parallel processing. And in our keynote speaker, our talk, there was a lot about that topic, and there's many ways of doing it. But the idea is to run multiple folds, hyperparameter choices, and repetitions at the same time. And for our final example, we'll be running uh, lasso regression with GLMnet. And if we try to uh, tune Lambda sequentially, it takes around a minute. If we parallel process, it's around half that time. And as a cherry on top, if we also define uh, our data as a sparse matrix, we can reduce it to 10 seconds. Uh, and GLMnet is also available in Python. So a lot of methods, there's far more, but I hope someone learned something today. I know people must be familiar with some aspects of this. All right, thank you. Uh, my email address is down here. I'd like to thank Quinn Chen and Rabbi Asseltine for all their guidance. Thank you, thank you, Chen. Thank you. All right, let's get to our next uh, speaker, um, David Corliss. Uh, David is uh, the principal data scientist and uh, 
Graphem Analytics. David, please share your screen and you can start your presentation. David, are you there? Hello, can you see my screen? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, but please share your screen. Sharing. There we are. And yes. now are we okay. good? Terrific. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much for the introduction, and I'm just thrilled to have a chance uh, to be able to present. Um, we're not going to see a lot of code or mathematical methods uh, per se in this one. What we're going to see is uh, is the st the statistical methods behind testing for bias, a process for doing this. We're going to look at root causes of bias and how to mitigate them. So this is a talk that's going to be about ethical AI and machine learning and how to produce better algorithms that are going to uh, drive better outcomes. So I think we all know the problem here. You know, a lot of us were thinking that uh, AI was going to be this wonderful thing. Machine learning algorithms are going to do all these uh, wonderful things. Uh, especially the idea was in many cases that by taking the human element out, by having a machine do this, it was supposed to make processes more fair. But, you know, oftentimes that has not worked out very well. So we have to ask ourselves what went wrong. Well, bias is what went wrong. So let's have a look at bias, how it gets into our algorithms, how we can measure it, and how we can minimize it. So one of the biggest causes of a bias is selection bias. Here we have an example of a facial recognition. Um, notice here we've got an algorithm of a train, but using a bias subset. Uh, in this case, uh, you've got a sm some smaller populations. Uh, that uh, maybe there we should have been, uh, you know, uh, oversampled in developing this. This is the work of Alex and Nijibi out of Harvard. Uh, we find that the rec the ability of facial recognition software is from some pretty major providers. It really varies depending on the kind of face it's trying to recognize. That's a concern. Also, when we see this particular case, this is also in the GP's work, uh, we find that this can result in a disparate impact or some group of people are affected more than others. So we've got, uh, in this case, uh, on the left, we've got Project Greenlight. This is uh, stoplight cameras uh, in uh, the city of Detroit. We know where those cameras got placed. Is a match for the Census Bureau demographics for that place? And so the weaknesses in facial recognition end up becoming weaknesses in policing practices. Bias training population, bias results. History problems, some people call it a prejudice problem. We'll see that in the literature. Here we're seeing that's more, uh, more generic name. The idea is machine learning can replace human decision making, but in this case, the problem is the algorithm was trained on previous human decisions. You see the individual input data needs to be screened for bias, in this case, the records are the problem, not who you chose, but the outcome are the problem. They need to be screened for bias so we can put them in, otherwise you're gonna get bias in, bias out. You're gonna train the algorithm to make the same mistakes that people have made in the past. Spaghetti problem. Um, if, if this is uh, where you've got many, many predictors, very often a concern with the text analytics. Um, in this case, you might have hundreds, even thousands of potential predictors. And I call the spaghetti problem is my name for it. The idea you may have heard the old wife sale, anything you throw at the wall, if it sticks, pasta is supposed to be done. Um, well, if an algorithm is trained by quote, anything that sticks, then there can be a, a problem with the outcome. I'll give you an example in reported in uh, news sources, especially Reuters, um, there was a company that looked at, uh, uh, developed a machine learning method to look at resumes. Uh, and it uh, was concerned that uh, women were uh, at a disadvantage of the resume screening process. Uh, careful examination found that uh, the word uh, softball in, appeared in the resume screening album. And if you played softball in college, you lost points in how your resume was rated. How many women play softball in co college? How many men play softball in college? This is how bias gets into the algorithm. 
in this particular case, bias predictors. Okay, we talked about bias sources. We talked about bias outcomes. In this case, the bias is conveyed like a disease vector in the predictors themselves. We have to screen the predictors. So what do we do? Well, we measure it using this old tried and true method borrowed from public health, disparate impact. In this particular example, uh, we've got uh, increasing a percentage of a particular racial group uh, had a greater impact in the very, very first uh, phases of the COVID ep epidemic. The important thing here, not the COVID example, this isn't even an algorithm bias thing. It gives us a tool, tried and true tool, well understood, well accepted to measure bias. We're going to look at disproportionate impact in particular. We're going to use, uh, we're going to use uh, log odds or odds ratios, especially. Odds ratios are especially good for dealing with non statisticians to measure the amount of disparate impact across different groups. Microsoft developed and then open sourced an algorithm in Python called FairLearn. Uh, it will calculate uh, by different, in this case, racial groups. You can do age, you can do gender, you can have different protected groups or simply groups that you're concerned about. Uh, and it's going to give you, uh, in this case, a confusion matrix. Watch for the confusion matrix because often people will talk about the accuracy, that's the diagonal elements. But bias is going to be found in the off diagonal elements. Is there bias and who it gets wrong? So we really need to have the whole confusion matrix, not just for accuracy, but also for the false positive and false negative. That's where most of the bias is gonna be found. Watch for that. One minute, we're just wrapping up. So the fair learner algorithm allows you to, to adjust for uh, different versions of this in the lower right-hand corner. It gives you the disparity of the predictions by whatever group you're looking at. And you can tweak a model, get different versions of the model that'll still perform well, and yet minimize the amount of bias. We're gonna minimize bias. So here's a, a summary of fair practices. I won't read you the slide. I will mention again, use odds ratios or relative risks is a good way to communicate uh, the story here and not using transparent models and open sourcing the data and the algorithm. References and time for questions. Thank you, David. We will see questions to the Q and A session at the end. Say questions here, of course. All right. Thank you. Okay. Let's get to our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Yulia Marchenko. Uh, Yulia has a PhD in statistics from Patrick and M, and she is the vice president of statistics and data science and uh, Stata Corp, and has been with the company for almost twenty years. Hello, everyone. Can you see my slides? Yes. All right, thank you. So, um, just to conserve bandwidth, I will turn off my um, I will turn off my video for now. And in this presentation, sorry, in this presentation today, I would like to um, describe briefly several important aspects of software reproducibility. So, here is a quick slide with a disclaimer that the views in this presentation are my own. So there are many ways um, to think about reproducibility and different people think of, the, uh, think of reproducibility in various mm -hmm. ways. Some people may think uh, about it as a way of simply replicating the published results, say using new data. Others may think about it as a way to automate certain tasks. In this presentation today, I'll talk about software reproducibility. And it relies on what I call scientific reproducibility. With scientific reproducibility, reproducibility we expect results to be the same when we perform it repeatedly under roughly the same uh, conditions. And then when I say the same results, I don't necessarily mean the results will match exactly, in which case we would expect ex exact reproducibility, but they would uh, agree within some acceptable tolerance, what I consider a finite precision reproducibility. And I will talk about what the same conditions means at the very end. Okay, we can further subdivide uh, scientific reproducibility into stochastic, numerical, computer reproducibility, and backward compatibility. Stochastic reproducibility 
um, expects the same results from a random procedure. And with numerical reproducibility, we would expect the same results from a deterministic but possibly iterative procedure. With computer reproducibility, we expect uh, to repeat the same results across different computers and operating system systems. And with backward compatibility, that backward compatibility ensures that we get the same results in the future from the same software, but potentially different versions of that same software. And here I will focus on backward compatibility um, achieved via so-called integrated version control, or IVC for short. So with IVC, you can write your code such that it runs reproducibly many years later in newer software versions. Now, it's important not to conf confuse IVC with source version control. This is where um, it helps you track changes over time and keep track of your project files as well. And it's also important to distinguish IVC from a container, which uh, merely bundles the existing software and code you have in an operating system to run this on other infrastructures. Genuine IVC requires careful and often rather time consuming actual merging of all of the all of the existing software code bases over time. And I believe Stata is the only statistical software package that offers IVC. Uh, for example, as a user, you can simply prefix your old command or code with the version statement. And then as a programmer, you have access to various built-in tools that help you track different versions and incorporate them when you're writing your methods or when you're implementing your code. For instance, here I show an example that, so say in the current version of Stata 18, you can use Stata CI command to compute um, um, confidence interval, binomial confidence intervals for proportions of variable y1 and y2 using this modern syst syntax. But you can also use the old syntax we used to have in prior versions by merely specifying the appropriate version in front of the specification here. So it is important to realize that IVC is not a time machine. So for instance, if there are any bugs or incorrect behavior, this is not something that will, would be version control. So that even if you're using your old syntax, your old code, you're still having access to modern com computations, to improvements. And you can read more about IVC at this website here. And so to conclude and go back, going back to our definition of scientific reproducibility and considering its main aspects I described earlier, we can now define what we would mean repeating results or analysis under the same conditions. Typically, if you are uh, looking into exact reproducibility, scientific reproducibility, that would typically be require uh, replicating the same operating system and computer setup. If you have an iterative procedure, you will uh, assume the same implementation of, say, iteration criteria using the same random number with a stochastic procedure. And it's important to keep in mind that ex exact scientific reproducibility may not always be feasible especially if you are comparing results between different computer architectures or different software packages. But with stable analysis, you should always expect at least finite, finite precision reproducibility. Um, this is all I have for today. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Yulia. So let's get to our next speaker, uh, the last speaker, um, Arinjita. Baheta Chenya, I, I hope my pronunciation is okay. So, uh, 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 Rinjita is uh, uh, from uh, Merck. Um, she's going to talk about an R package for analysis and aggregation of the content of 
clinicaltrials.gov. Thank you so much for the introduction and you are right. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, we can see your screen. So thank you so much for attending my talk. Today it is on ACT reveal and R package for analysis and aggregation of the content of clinical trials gov. So it is a joint work with Howard, uh, who is just presented look. Uh, uh, and he was a summer intern with us at Mark and also with Jawe, uh, Fong and Thomas from Mark. So this is the agenda. Uh, I will go through the ACT database, our package ACT reveal, uh, the GitHub page and demo if we have time and then a small summary of what we are doing. So aggregate content of clinical trials dot gov act is a publicly available database that contains a variety of trial level information for every study registered in clinical trials gov so this is how the page looks for act so you can download the data for you can also download static copies of the data or you can directly download the data from here and uh, work on it and you have to create an account for that in the uh, ACT uh, page, and then you can uh, 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 work with the data. So ACT contains both study protocol and results data elements. So it is downloaded from clinical dials uh, daily and loaded into ACT. So this research work is basically about an open source uh, R package called ACT Re Reveal, which provides functions for consolidating uh, analysis datasets for a from ACT. This can help in conducting meta analysis using analysis datasets. The main function extract ACT conducts a comprehensive search of clinical trials by looking for related search terms. Uh, uh, for such terms and conditions, example, uh, primrolizumab or breast cancer and utilizing fuzzy string searching. So basically, if we give a search term and it will search for uh, other terms that are also uh, related to uh, the and say primrolizumab or breast cancer, such as like this, as you can see in the search results from clinicaltrials.gov. So then it fetches the desired outcome data such as treatment effect estimates, confidence intervals, odds ratios, and then overall survival rate and uh, overall survival, then hazard ratios, etc. from the uh, query outcomes function, which helps in this. So this is the summary. So our package is developed for public use. Although the demo of the package will focus on oncology trials, the package makes it easier for statisticians to explore ACT in other respective therapeutic areas as well. It is publicly available at GitHub. So these are the references and thank you so much for listening. Let me give you a demo for the R package. As it, Can you see my R screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. So we have to have dev tools for this package. This is our ACT reveal package. So here I'm not going to use the uh, uh, data from directly downloaded from the uh, ACT uh, uh, ACT page, you can download it using this kind of username and password, and this is the command for that. I'm going to use static copy, so that is uh, available in my uh, in my local uh, desktop. So this is the command load data command where you can uh, download the data separately, such as outcome measurements, studies, interventions, so several uh, sponsors, res result groups, etc. And from there, uh, once you have the data, you uh, initialize these uh, things. And these are the initial terms that you are looking for. And this is the condition that you are looking for. And this is the related terms. And then once you hit query initiate, it will gather all the terms and all the trials that are uh, related to this uh, uh, initial terms and initial condition.
so that's there and we can show you query initial so these are all the condition search terms these are the treatment search terms and these are the trials that came up to, uh, that are uh, related to this uh, search then we want to get the overall response rate and objective response rate and also the overall survival from there so we will use the uh, uh, function query outcomes here so this is query outcomes and I can show you the full analysis table. So these are the NCT IDs. These are the condition, allocation, intervention model, et cetera. So finally, the most important part here is the values that are also getting collected, uh, say here, uh, outcome category ORR, ORR is objective response rate and OS is overall survival. And uh, you have, the parameter values here, as you can see here, the p values are there, and then there is a confidence interval, uh, upper limit, lower limit, non informality type, and then outcome type. Everything is gets gets collected. So you can use this data for uh, some kind of analysis. For now, this is just a demo. So I have. Many, please. Yeah, thank you. I have used it uh, as a uh, for. Um, uh histogram plot for the parameter uh, values that are there so these are the orr and os plot and uh that's more about it so thank you so much for listening uh, uh thank you for your time if you have any questions please let me know yes thank you very much all right so uh i'm glad that we are on time uh thank you for uh Thank you, everyone. Thank you all the speakers for their insightful presentations. Uh, personally, I'm very impressed by the diversity of topics we've uh, explored today. Uh, so we are now going to move into the Q&A session. We have a few minutes to further discuss those intriguing ideas. Um, if you have any questions, please uh, submit uh, in the chat or the Q&A session. Um, I think I saw several comments. Uh, these are not questions, but I want to mention here. Um, uh, for the presentation from uh, Zoe uh, and uh, Emily on using game plan for teaching statistics, there are quite a few comments saying that uh, um, um, they love the emphasis on the thought process. Uh, they can see that the approach being much more inclusive and developing of critical reasoning over coding. And I myself also very much agree. Uh, I think it's a great idea. I think it's to me more like more like uh, writing. Uh, Ask students to write solo code before actually implementing and think about the ordering of computation, everything, right? So I think that also helps to perhaps later on debug the code. Um, if I, yeah, I, I wonder if you can just quickly comment on on those interesting points. I think that it could. I don't know if we've like formalized a way to like measure that. Um, but we're hoping to get student feedback. We've designed some survey questions to ask about a little bit of that. But I know just in the classroom, I've used it as a strategy to get them to kind of debug or think about what they're doing. And so sometimes I struggled with just trying to like give them the answer. And this has given me a method to say like, okay, well like talk me through your game plan. What did you do? And where does that align? And so I think it does help with that a little bit. And so maybe the debugging could come from there if they kind of learn to start asking themselves those questions. Right. So it's Jing actually question. asks, uh, uh, is this comp stack computing course for undergrad or graduate students? What are the prerequisites? We actually have two different courses that are, well, two different numbers that are the same course. Essentially, one is for um, graduate students and one is for undergrads. The classes that we have are, I don't know, maybe 95% undergrads and about 5% master's students. Um, we are an undergrad primarily institution. Um, there are two main prereqs for the course. They have to have taken an intro statistics course, which feels like a little bit less of an important prereq for us in teaching it. It's more the computing prereq that is important. So there's a, a basic statistics prereq as well as a basic computing prereq. But I think it's just basically like CS 101. Um, and so some students have seen R, but mostly not. All right. Yeah, there's another question for you guys. 
uh, do you encourage peer review of the game plans? Is there a common language that can they can take advantage of to sync through the plans? I will say we, I don't think either of us have used peer review. Um, we are in our second year here, so this is very new for us implementing it and we're trying to sort of balance like getting used to being professors while also introducing some of this new stuff. I am interested in one of the things I'm thinking about this year is getting students to write game plans and then provide those game plans to a peer where then they, that other person has to write the code corresponding to that game plan. Um, so that's, I don't know if that's really peer review, but it's sort of like making sure you're being explicit in what you're planning um, so that somebody else can understand your thought process. But again, that's not something I've done yet. Um, Emily, have you done any peer review? Uh, no, I have not. I feel like I taught at kind of the quarter before Zoe and ad hoc started doing it just as a way to like get students to think. And then we started realizing that maybe there was something to this. Um, so as we kind of said, we're formalizing this a little bit more. Okay. Yeah, it seems like people are really interested in the methods you're using for teaching. Uh, one more question for you guys. Uh, do you believe that a computing prerequisite is needed? So this is an interesting question. We're in the process of switching over to semesters in a couple of years, and we've actually restructured the way that the computing uh, courses are gonna look like in statistics. We've added a little bit more heavier computing to reflect kind of changes and stuff happening. And we're actually taking, and the first time that they see any sort of like programming or computing is going to be in uh, an intro R class. And so we're gonna kind of break this class into two pieces and kind of expand on each so that they're seeing that kind of for the first time. Um, and then they're going a little further in depth in the intermediate class. And that'll help too for like biology majors and things like that to make it a little more accessible because right now the computing prereq does prevent a lot of them from taking it. I see. Um, so okay. some changes coming up, but. Yep. All right. So, um, well, I think uh, I will have the privilege to ask the last question. I, I want to ask the question uh, um, to David. David Corliss, do, are you there? Yes, I am. Yeah, so yeah, you, the topic you presented is really interesting. Uh -huh. um, of course, there are lots of things to discuss about the bias and uh, yes. AI models. But recently, you know, I submitted a paper to a journal, but the journal actually prohibited us from using any of those variables, race, ethnicity, things like that, in the predictive model. So, um, in that case, then actually we don't <laughs> have idea about how to check whether the model is biased towards any demographic, uh, you know, uh, uh, groups. And so, I want just to hear your thoughts about this. Uh, a couple of things. The way we're going to measure bias, and you know, we can use more advanced methods. It's nice to have one one particular method that's going to work for both scientists and non scientists. And I'm going to recommend log odds. And what you're going to do is you're going to take those different groups. You know, we're concerned that this particular and it's a legitimate concern, but it can be measured. You can't be going, in my opinion, in my opinion, you can't be going. Oh no, no, no I'm not going to take this paper. There's a risk of bias, or this is a biased predictor. Well, no, that's something that can be measured. That's something that we can teach our students how to measure. And we're going to use disparate impact to do that. We're going to look at what's the outcome. We're just going to pay special attention to the off-diagonal element of the confusion matrix. What are the ones that were wrong? False positives, false negatives. Is there a disproportionate number of people who are advantaged or disadvantaged based on the uh, indelible characteristic of identity, uh, gender, age, race, what have you. So we can measure that. So my response to that, if I had that happen, I'm concerned they happen uh, to me, uh, is I would send them, you know, we've screened this for bias. We've looked to see, let's just use age as an example. Uh, our, is this algorithm being hard on older people? Well, what's the outcome? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? Okay, let's suppose it's a good thing. Um, if you look at the, the folks at a higher age group, several different groups along the way have a stair step. And is there a, a substantial difference in the prediction of the algorithm, especially the false positives and false negatives for the different age groups? And you could do this for whatever group yeah. I just gave yeah. ages and attempts. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, Thank we, you. we can discuss offline. Uh, sure, let's do that. Yeah, so I think I used up uh, all the five minutes uh, break time. Uh, we will get to the next session. David, 